Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. I hope all the listeners are doing as fantastic as I am. How are you? <laughs> I am doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. And in this episode, Lance, we speak to a new friend, a new friend named Christy Arnhart. She has been associated with an old friend of ours, John Lorden of Brain Scratch fame for some time now. She does some researching for him and she pops into his, I believe, Searchlight episodes. So Christy approached us on TikTok. Make sure to follow us on TikTok, by the way. We're there as Crawl Space and Missing. And she mentioned she'd love to talk about this case, the disappearance of Brooke Allensworth from Oil Trough, Arkansas on July 11th, 2018. This is one of the disappearances that has really resonated with Christy. I, I find it um, so fascinating when people have that one that sticks with them for so long. And Brooke is the one that sticks with Christy uh, for a number of reasons. And she's done such a great job digging into this, speaking with people. Um, and if anyone has any information about Brooks' disappearance, please contact the Independence County Sheriff's Department at 870-793-8838. Three eight, And again, listen to this interview and just know like what work Christy has been putting into uncovering the answers in Brooks' disappearance. It's relatively recent, 2018, so it's just a few years old. As far as cold cases go, that's not very cold. So there's definitely potential here to bring some uh, closure. Yeah, and it's another disappearance case where a car is left, Lance. I feel like we cover these a lot, whether it's from our work on missing with private investigations for the missing or on our work on missing Maura Murray, the, um, that podcast, Lance, because Maura Murray's car was left there as well. And Brooke was 37 years old at the time of her disappearance. She's 5'8", in the range of 170 to 185 pounds. When she went missing, she was wearing dark blue denim shorts and two left shoes, one a flip-flop and a sandal on the other foot. And Tim, we will be hitting up the fine city of Las Vegas on April 29th, 30th, and May 1st. Why are we going there? I need to be reminded. It's the culture, Lance. I just love the history of Las Vegas. Um, no, just kidding. It's CrimeCon 2022, Lance. And you can get 10% off your standard badge by using code CRAWLSPACE when you check out. And this is going to be a great time, Lance. We haven't been to a CrimeCon in three years. I don't know the next time we're going to get to go, but we are going to do two live shows. We're going to do a live crawl space and we'll do a live missing right there from the podcast row studio. It's going to be a blast. We're going to be causing a scene. I promise you. <laughs> so come say hi. And we can't wait to see you. We can't wait to see your faces. Swing over to Podcast Row. We'll be hanging out there with all the other uh, partners in the true crime podcasting biz. We will be there with our new partners at Glassbox Media as they represent their network of true crime shows. And you're more than welcome to pop by and find out more about them as well. But I feel like if you're on the fence, I keep saying this, if you're on the fence and you don't know whether or not you want to go to CrimeCon, perhaps you've been there there in the past like remember that moment where you walked onto podcast row and you saw all those people and how excited you were about that uh and you got to talk to them that feeling is the same for us when we see those people come in it's we're, we're probably more excited because everyone who goes there everyone who listens we care so much about the best the best part of it is seeing everybody flood in that first time and uh and knowing like this is going to be the weekend where you get to uh interact and and just I don't know, geek out about whatever and just have some laughs, have a couple of drinks. So yeah, if you're on the fence, think about that moment. Use code CRAWLSPACE. You'll get 10% off. It's a fantastic time. Viva Las Vegas. And Lance, you mentioned Glassbox. Glassbox has helped us set up a new subscription service for CrawlSpace. And you can find it at crawlspace.supportingcast.fm. And we're bringing a weekly bonus show called The Crawlspace Crypt that has been an absolute blast to do uh, so far. And it's me, you, and Jen. And we're talking about life behind the scenes here at Crawlspace Media, at the show, um, what episodes are upcoming, what it was like to speak to people off the air sometimes. It's just a, a great show, and I feel like it helps me get a lot off my chest, things that I haven't said on the air. Well, I think that's something that we've uh, learned as uh, we've been recording, especially bringing Jen on and having that third person there to regulate at sometimes the conversation. And there's so much that doesn't make that cut for the public feed. 
again, having that third person brings a new dynamic. So we have these moments as we're recording that we sometimes go off the rails and, and we have to make a note of that because that's what we want people to enjoy with us. Uh, what we talk about for the most part is pretty heavy. And, and you need these moments where you just kind of decompress or you just have a silly moment. We realize how valuable that is for the listener as well, right? As far as just your 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 state of mind as you're listening to it, just to check it out. It's it's just a relief to uh, to be a part of, and it's a relief to hear. Yeah, we'll go a little bit deeper into some of the stories we cover, and we also have one for missing as well, which you can access by going to missing.supportingcast.fm, and we've been doing a weekly show there as well called Hidden Opinions, um, which which has been a lot of fun too. All right, everybody, thanks a lot for listening. Check out the show notes if you want to hear more from Christy and John Lorden about the disappearance of Brooke Allensworth. All right, we're going to go to a commercial here. Make sure to follow us on social media at Crawlspace Podcast or Crawlspace Pod. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Christy Arnhart. How are you today? I'm good. How are you guys doing? We're fantastic. And uh, we're so excited to have you on the show today. Uh, a couple of things. Before we started recording, you popped on and just through the mutual friendship and, and I guess, uh, professional relationship that we have with John Lorden and, and then seeing your face, like it just felt like we've been friends for a while. So <laughs> it's already it's already very comfortable. And uh, usually people are super intimidated by us, but you don't seem to be, which no. is nice. No, okay. uh-uh. Christy, before we get into um, the case today, can you tell us a little bit about what you do with John Lorden and Brain Scratch? Pretty much anything John needs, I do. I do anything from research to scripting episodes. I co-host on Case Cracked, and that's one that I script. You know, I I get everything together for him on that. We have a discussion at the end. Um, I help write podcasts. I help make sure our community managers who watch all of our comments, who pop in podcasts and whatnot, make sure they're all taken care of. Everybody's happy. So pretty much anything Lord and Arts, I've got my hands on somewhere. (laughs) Very cool. If if you're in danger, blink twice. Because we've always, <laughs> this sounds very culty. I mean, John, has got, John does have a bit of a cultiness to him. He's got <laughs> good followers. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm totally kidding. He, he's amazing. And I love the fact that he's put together this community. And I love the fact mm-hmm. that, that you're on board and you do such a great job with all of those, all of those, uh, I don't want to say duties, but those tasks, you know, mm-hmm. like you, you're just you're doing a great job with the research and the management and it's all for a good cause. So tip of the cap. Oh, yes, we've got. Thank you. We have got such great people and everyone is so passionate. It's easy to do these things. It really is. And you appear with John Lorden on Brain Scratch occasionally? No, I actually appear each week on Case Cracked. Oh, he has three okay. shows. Mm. We've got Case Cracked that explores the evidence that solved crimes. Then we have Searchlight, which is, of course, for missing people, and then Brain Scratch on Fridays. So, no, I've never been on either of those. Ah, well, see, that's too bad, you know. So we're breaking new ground here, you know, a little bit. We're sort of, uh, you know, just just to just let, let John know that, you know, you're always welcome here to be featured. You know, I don't know why he kind of keeps you down a little bit. <laughs> Um, not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I, I'd love to come anytime. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you uh, for joining us. And um, you put together some research today about the disappearance of a woman named Brooke Allensworth. And I, 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 real quick, the information that you've put together, the details of the, the events leading up to her disappearance and, and then the subsequent details after her disappearance, uh, it's, it's so well done. Uh, I'm just wondering, is this something that you've always been interested in? Does it relate to what you, I guess, maybe have done professionally in your past? No, I've never done anything like this before. I have always been interested in true crime. I'm always more interested in what makes people tick, which is why missing persons cases are so interesting for me. But no, I've never done anything like this. I just like to be thorough. Can you tell us a little bit about Brooke? Yes. Uh, Brooke is from Arkansas. 
And she's actually not, she's around the area that I'm in, in Arkansas. So this case has always really stuck with me. You know, she's a mother of three. She was a nurse. She's a very talented artist. And it's one of those cases where there just seems to be nothing out there after the initial reports and searches were done. We just have nothing. This one actually took place in 2018. Uh, The first reports that you get are from her father, Aubrey. And he says that from the 10th to the 12th of July, she was last seen in either Newark or Newport, Arkansas. Around the 10th, it could have possibly been the 12th. She was seen again in Searcy, had a disagreement with her estranged ex-husband, and they are divorced now. And to be honest with you, this conversation that he talks about, I can't even find it anywhere but one article. So I've always tried to use it as side information, but not to hang too much on it. I was afraid to because it wasn't picked up more. But the next time we hear about Brooke is on the 11th, actually, within that time frame. She comes into Independence County and has her hair and nails done. And when she does, she has her hair dyed blonde. Normally, it's a dark brown. So I don't know if that's an indicator or not, but, you know, she had the full shebang done. Yeah. When you were putting the research together, did that stand out to you as perhaps she was trying to alter her uh, her look? I, you know, I don't want to come out and say it, but maybe something was going on and she needed to alter her look and, and perhaps uh, just appear different for a little while, maybe somewhere else. I did have that thought. Yeah. I really did. Um, especially, you know, with her disappearance happening so fast after that, because by the 12th, we're already starting to get reports that people are losing sight of her and things are starting to happen. So, yeah, it definitely jumped up in my mind. And that was a different, like a pretty, pretty different color uh, for her. Oh, she yes. Has, yeah. Usually has brown hair yes. and uh, unusual for her to get it dyed blonde, apparently. Well, I know that she had had this done before, but it wasn't, you know, if you look all the pictures that we have of her are with the brown hair. So it was something, you know, she wore her natural color more than she did the blonde. Now, have police released which salon that was? No, they haven't. There's multiple agencies handling parts of the investigation with the state police taking care of it under their umbrella. So the investigating agency that talked to them, anytime the sheriff talks to the press, he doesn't have that agency's notes in front of him. So we know they have been talked to and they couldn't, they didn't release if there was anything suspicious, not suspicious, just we've talked to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we probably hard to take anything from that, not releasing that info. It is because they don't really give you a feeling one way or the other about it. Now, when we go into the 12th, she left in her car from Newport, headed to Searcy. Now, on the way, her 2007 Toyota Camry had a flat tire. They tried to fix it with a -a fix-a-flat, and I've heard two different things. A passerby helped her fix it with fix-a-flat, and I also was told that a family friend, a friend of hers, like the day before, had tried to fix it at her house. But regardless, she's having trouble with the tire. She tries fix-a-flat, and on this trip, the tire goes flat again. So she's pulled off the highway into an area by the White River Bridge just outside of Oil Trough. Oil Trough is going to, it's not even halfway between Searcy and Newport. I'd say it's probably closer to Newport than it is to Searcy. This car is pulled under the bridge. It's sitting there with a flat tire. No one has seen her since. No, there are not even reports of anyone seeing her drive the car under the bridge. That was something that bothered me, too. If you need help with your car, usually you'll sit on the side of the road. You'll wait for a friend. I mean, this is a small enough area. Somebody would have come by that she knew and they would have helped her. But when they put the car under the bridge like this, you can't see it at all. So it's hidden from the road? Yes, it is. You have to drive under the ridge and go to the boat ramp to see it. Yeah. Very interesting. This isn't a case where, because where your brain goes almost immediately with the fix a flat is that somebody set it up for her car to have a flat tire the way you've seen in other, you know, famously in like the Zodiac case. I think that's where people's heads go, but that's not the case here, right? It doesn't appear to be. The only thing I have a question about is, did she drive the, the car under the bridge or was it placed there later? Right. And, and my other question on that is, this is a place where it's like a boat ramp going into the water, right? Yes. Right. So if somebody had taken that car and went through the effort to bring it all the way there, not like it's super far, but went to the effort to place it there, why didn't they continue, if they were looking to hide the car, why didn't they continue on just 
down the boat ramp into the water. Well, I don't think that the river is deep enough at that point. Ah, gotcha. Uh, yeah. This is, yeah, it's, I mean, I've been down there and looked at it myself and I could, I could wade out there no more than waist deep, I think. Oh, interesting. Good point. Okay. So it would actually cause more of a scene to have a car yeah. up to its doors in water. But it looks like it could have been at least driven into the, the wooded area there maybe a little bit. Yes. Yeah. There were high weeds out there. There were, there's trees and forest nearby and it could have been it seems as though keeping it under the bridge like that with a flat tire just made everybody think well they'll be back right yeah and this this is an area that i i can see that sometimes seems like kids will hang out at there's some graffiti on the uh the bridge poles there i guess yeah it's a really rural farming area so there's not a lot to do out there okay interesting Now, I believe somewhere around the 14th, a sheriff's deputy saw her car parked under the bridge and he assumed like the rest of us. Well, she got a flat. Somebody probably picked her up. She'll be back to fix it. He made a note and then that was it. They didn't think anything else of it until the 24th when her father called in and reported her missing. Now, there's no explanation as to why they waited 10 days or two, about two weeks to report this. But from what I've read, they don't, they didn't find anything suspicious about it either. So it may be that she, you know, she talked to her family once a week or something like that. Right. Right. Cause we're not dealing with, or this isn't the situation where it's a, you know, a 17 or 18 year old young woman. You no, know, no. I believe she was 36. Yeah. Yeah. Where this is, you know, somebody who probably, like you said, wasn't in constant contact with the with her family. Very interesting. You mentioned something before we started about the dates and how there's just a couple of things that 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 are like little little thorns in your side about the dates. And when you're talking about it, it occurred to me that it's very important for listeners to hear this because it brings like this human element to putting together a document and assembling all these details. Um, Yeah. what, What is it about the dates that are sticking points to you? Well, I always like to have a solid timeline so I can see all those points of interest. And on this one, the dates around the time she disappeared to her father calling to the car being found happens between July 24th and July 26th. But depending on what media source you go to, you're going to hear a different date. So from what I could tell and the best information I got together was that on the 24th, he reported her missing. That's when the deputy started to remember, hey, I saw that car under the bridge. So on the 25th, officers find her car under the bridge with the flat. It's locked. Her keys were not in the car. They couldn't find the keys, but her cigarettes and her cell phone were in there. There was no sign of struggle. Nothing like that. It's the sheriff said it looked like someone had just locked it up and walked away to come back. So it was there for about 12 days? Yeah. And like I said, with it being off the road like this. Yeah, usually they'll have them towed pretty quickly if it's on the highway, but being under the boat ramp like this, they didn't. And it's not like it's a parking lot. Like it's, you know, if you're trying to go somewhere, like you probably just would have found like a long-term parking parking lot where it wouldn't have been conspicuous. Although I guess this worked pretty well still, t- yeah. you know, 12 days. No, it was a small parking lot that was mainly there so people could park their trucks and trailers after they had put their boats into the water. Okay. So- it's potential, potentially reasonable to assume that she left it there to come back to it later. Yes, it is. Yes, mm-hmm. that's reasonable. Okay. And the doors were locked. Mm-hmm. And it, it's always bothered me with her cell phone and her cigarettes being in the car. As an ex-smoker, I wouldn't have left my cigarettes anywhere but in my pocket. And whether my cell phone was dead or still running, I would have taken it with me. Mm-hmm. So I thought yeah. that was very odd. And did I miss anything here? Was there a purse in the car? I never heard anything about her purse or her wallet. I have looked everywhere and never found anything about that. Interesting. Again, that speaks to just the human level of the research that you're doing that people I feel is important to hear. Uh, You're 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 looking everywhere and you're not you know, you don't have credentials where you can walk into like a police department and say, give me what you got. You know, you're a citizen who's 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 doing the best she can. So. Uh, again, like kudos to you for, for the hard work you've put into it. You would think that she would have a purse, though. You would. 
You would. And that may be the next thing that I ask the sheriff's department, because so far the Independence County Sheriff's Department has been very good to answer my questions. So yeah, that's yeah. interesting. How do yeah. you approach them? Well, they have an email that anybody can send emails to. And I just popped in there and told them who I was and what I did. And I, I was advocating for her case and I would be on a podcast soon. And I wanted to know that my information was absolutely correct. The ones I had questions about, I sent and did not send the wallet. So that will be the next one that I ask about. Interesting. Yeah, yeah well done. It's a good uh, technique to contact law enforcement. I'm going on a podcast. I'm, I am doing this. Here's the information that I do have. Can you back this up for me? Uh, I think it's, it's almost that like easier to ask for forgiveness later type thing almost like that like you're, yeah. you're telling them this is this is already happening can you just like make sure i'm doing it right yes and i'm really glad that they're helping like that that's the dream is to have law enforcement you know work with citizens more because we can we can help out in ways that they don't realize yeah without a doubt and are you in contact with a lot of the uh, law enforcement agencies for the cases you cover not usually. The cases that I cover, especially for Case Cracked, they're already solved. So I really don't have to do it very often. But when I have something like this, it doesn't bother me a bit. I mean, the worst they can say is no. So yeah, don't be afraid. Does it look like Brooke could have gotten on a boat? I mean, is that, I mean, I know this is Speculation City, uh, but um, like... It, well, that's is totally it, feasible. Is that, so there are boats parked there or it's mostly a place for people to pull their boat down? It's a place for people to pull their boats down. Nobody really leaves them sitting there. This kind of fishing, you know. And what kind of water is it? You said it wasn't that deep? At this point, it's not deep. The White River runs, I think it runs all the way through the state. And like where I live on the White River, it's very deep. But when you go out to this little interchange down by Newark and Oil Trough, especially depending on the time of year, and it was July. That's the one of the hottest months we have. We don't get any rain, so it's going to be down too. Okay, how's the cell service in that area and then on the White River in that area? It depends on what service provider you use. Do I know, we know what, what she had, what Brooke had? No, no, we don't. We don't. Interesting. Just trying to come up with ideas for why she, why her phone was in the car, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, and then obviously you see the flat tire. So, I mean, I think one obvious thing you would think of is maybe she was asking for help. But uh, as you noted earlier, why pull so far in um, if she pulled the car in because of a flat tire? Right. Huh. I know. Okay. It's confusing. Mm-hmm. I know the sheriff's office, they impounded her car. They took several DNA swabs from it. They got the results back. Some of them were from Brooke. Some of them were from other donors, but none of them turned up any results as far as a suspect. So they haven't been able to go anywhere with that. The cell phone was sent to the state police and it has been dumped, but they're still waiting on the results from the state police to come back. And that was a year ago that they sent it in. Hmm. And what do you uh, mean when you say it was dumped? Well, that's actually, I think that's the terminology that he used. Uh, They didn't have the technology here in the county to take all of the information off of that phone and then look at it. And they said the state police had that capability. They have searched the area under the bridge a couple of different times with boats. They've used cadaver dogs. They've used volunteers and deputies in the woods. They've even used airplanes flying over and looking and They have just no lead they have found has panned out. They haven't found a single trace of her anywhere. And so the DNA that they found in her car, I know they, the wording is kind of specific Mm -hmm. uh, that they'll use, you know, did not turn up any results as far as a suspect that is so vague could mean like everyone that they found DNA for was identified and, you know, there was an alibi or it could mean um, there was DNA found and we don't know whose it was, you know, that's true. You know, and she had three kids too. So I'm sure theirs were mixed in there. And yeah, I don't know. That was, that was a blow. I was really hoping the DNA would show something. So now the only thing we have to hinge this on is her cell phone data. Hope something turns up in that. Yeah, I guess it still could. I guess that, you know, if if there's um, someone to match it against. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. But if you're talking about something random happening to her, that's tough. Yeah, it is. 
a stranger or a near stranger. Hopefully something is on her cell phone, but if you're acquainted with somebody enough where you'd make a phone call to them, you'd know their phone number or a text message, wouldn't wouldn't someone else know? You know, like wouldn't a friend know or wouldn't this person be mentioned somewhere Somewhere, you know, yeah. unless it was like somebody happened upon her and, and they gave her their cell phone number because they were, I don't know, helping out with her her uh, flat tire or something. I, I, again, I don't want to go down the, the speculation route, but it yeah. it just drives me bananas to see a car locked, cell phone inside. Like, how many times do we hear this story? Cell phone inside um, something, whether this time it's a pack of cigarettes, just something that most people would take with them it's Mm -hmm. almost like that pack of cigarettes backs up the cell phone you know everyone's got their cell phone on them and just to back it up she's a smoker and she also leaves her cigarettes there so what happened you can accidentally leave one thing right yeah you could could, like oops i forgot my cigarettes or the cell phone but the fact that there's the other one there just Mm -hmm. makes it seem even worse because she just ran away but then she had time to lock her car yeah you know it's it's uh uh it helps to talk it through, but it almost like sometimes I just feel like I'm talking myself into a bigger knot. Yeah. And that's what I feel like, too, on this one. I really do, because the only thing that I have are rumors and speculation from the area. And, you know, you, you really try not to enter into that because you Lord, you don't want to insult anybody. You don't want to lead people in the wrong direction. I know mm-hmm. there was one really odd point about her disappearance when her clothing description She was actually wearing two left shoes. One was a flip-flop and the other was a wedge sandal. And nobody has any explanation for this. I read that like 15 times. Yeah. That that it's two different shoes, Mm -hmm. two left shoes. Mm -hmm. It is. And you know, a wedge wedge sandal's got a heel on it. So it's, that was really unusual and I've never found an explanation for it. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Yeah, some some strange behavior here, um, I guess, right before she goes missing. Mm-hmm. Um, that would almost, yeah, imply a quick exit or something like that. I mean, I don't even know. That's kind of strange, even still. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's uh, I, I don't think I've ever, like, said this out loud, but that's one of my, like, random fears. Like, the, like, so, you know, some people just see something that makes them uncomfortable. Like, having your shoes on the wrong feet like really, really bothers me. And, uh, you know, it's kind of amusing, but I'm not trying to make a joke. It it yeah. really bothers me. There's like, I don't know what it is. It's just like, it. it's not like quite a phobia, but it's an, it like gets under my skin and, and reading that is so, so, so odd. Mm-hmm. It is. Two left shoes. What was Two she left shoes. like? Yeah, exactly. Two different shoes. I, I can't imagine. And I can't imagine what would make me leave the house, especially if I'm making the trip that she is. I mean, what if you have to get out somewhere? What if you have to get gas? Something like that. I... Do you happen to know which shoe was on the correct foot, which was on her left foot? No. Because one of them was correct. Yeah. No, I don't know which one. And and one more quick question on this. There's no indication of where the other corresponding shoes are? They haven't mentioned it. Oh, I hate this. I hate this conversation so much. <laughs> well, well, that's a good a good question though, because if they were at home, then you would have known like she was definitely at home first, and maybe and you know did did something bizarre on her way out the door, you know. Mm-hmm. And do, do we know when the flat tire occurred? On the twelfth. Oh, it did. Okay. Yeah, unless uh, you know her sister. I saw her sister post some things on web sleuths, and she was never verified, but she really did seem to be her sister. You know, she said that it had happened on the 11th and somebody had tried to help fix the flat. But everything else that you read, they flat out say, no, it was the 12th that she had the flat tire. I wonder if the sister knew about it before she went missing. I don't know. I don't know. There are so many questions that you're left with. The only other kind of remarkable thing about this, I thought, was uh, there was another woman murdered in 2020 in the same area. And I know that they have questioned her murderer. It's Quake Llewellyn as to whether or not, and Sydney Sutherland is the, the woman that he killed. I know a lot of people were following that. They have questioned him as to whether or not he knew Brooke. 
He's saying he had no involvement. And as far as I can tell, they have never made a connection. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting angle, I, f I feel like, though. So this is a, a guy who actually knew Sydney Sutherland. Yes. And uh, and was in her her Facebook group, even showed up to search for her when she went missing. Yes. But also killed her. And um, and he was pretty local to that area. He there was other reports of him stalking other women as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He lived. Uh, I don't know exactly where he lived in the Newport area, probably on the outskirts of town where the farmland is because he was a farmer. And I believe that when she disappeared, she was on a county road going for a run. So that would make sense. Right. Yeah. So that that is interesting. Um, Sydney was was jogging. And, you know, I think one could argue Brooke was uh, in need of assistance, I guess, on the side of the road. You know, I mean, there's mm -hmm. nothing saying this guy couldn't have, I, I suppose, driven her car down to that point later after abducting her or something like that. Obviously, again, high speculation here. But, you know, he did something similar before. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, but and, and obviously his DNA would have been run, I would think you would think. Yes. Yes. He's incarcerated. And yeah. And if it's definitely was not in the car. Because at first it seems like, again, you have that romantic connection between what we've seen in media for how they portray serial killers. And looking at um, Sydney's picture, she has nearly platinum blonde hair. Uh, she's got blonde hair. And then you know that Brooke recently dyed her hair blonde. So it, it you know, you can try to put that together as well. But it just it comes down to DNA. They if 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 he did anything, obviously, it would have been around the car or something like there, yeah. there would have been something. Yeah. Yeah, although as of 2020, they said they're still questioning him in Brooke Allensworth disappearance until we are satisfied, quote unquote. Well, and I mean, they have no way to rule him out at this point. Yeah, I suppose. And no way to rule him in. So, you know, probably not him. It's definitely an interesting angle, though. Yeah. You know, with the amount of stalking that he had had done, it wouldn't wouldn't be that surprising to hear uh, if he had other victims. Yeah, that, no, that wouldn't surprise me at all. And Sydney's was so brutal. You just, you're like, is that really the first time he's done this? It does make you think. And do you have any um, information on the nature of the relationship that she had with her estranged ex-husband, Brad? The only thing that I have, again, just lead to rumors. You know, I know that they didn't get along. And I know that there was some drug use there, but nothing more than that. And, and was he questioned? Yes. Yeah, he's been questioned. I don't know the specifics of it. But and like I said, even the article that I found that mentioned this fight that they had, it's it's already down. It's not posted anymore. I had to use the Wayback Machine to find it. So, uh, yeah, it's just more speculation, I guess. And you mentioned in the uh, details that you've put together that the flat tire is a regular size tire. It's not a replacement donut tire. Yes, that's correct. When you look at the pictures, because, you know, it's set under the bridge before it was towed away to be looked at at all. So film crews had time to go out and film the car. And it does look like a donut, but it's not. It's the full tire. It just doesn't have a hubcap on it. And it's flat. Mm -hmm. Do you know if she had a spare in the trunk? I do not know. Probably not if she's using like fix a flat. That's what I would assume. I would yeah. assume either her spare's flat and can't be fixed or she just doesn't have one. Right. Right. So if the tire really popped on the 11th, then she was sort of, I guess, driving it around a little bit with the fix a flat, you know, having have it. So it's kind of in a state of uh, it could, this could happen again at any moment as you drive a vehicle with that. Um, and that seems to be what happened, I guess, because it's it is flat in the photos. Oh, yes. Yeah. And our roads around here are rough, especially in rural areas. So I wouldn't have expected it to last long. Do you think that that has anything to do with their disappearance, just in your opinion, putting all this material together? The flat does. It does. I don't know if somebody grabbed her because they knew this was going to happen. They knew she wasn't going to make it further. If they came up on her on the side of the road and took her as opportunity and then moved her car. But yeah, I feel like the flat tire is important. I do too. Do you think there was any reason for her to want to get away or any, was she in danger of any kind that you know of? Not that I know of. Everything that I've looked at, you know, she was doing fine. I'd find no reports of, of anything, no restraining orders, no, you know, I'm, I'm afraid for my life, no nothing. She was just living her life from what I can tell. Yeah. How about her friends? 
What was her? Do you have anything on like the circle of friends that she hung around with? They haven't released anything. I know from news reports at the candlelight vigils and whatnot that they've held. Everybody's very stunned. You know, she was well liked. She's missed. And they all say the same thing. You know, she would have never left her children. How long do you usually spend when you're putting together uh, the research on a particular missing person? Well, it depends. Usually just sitting down and doing a day's worth of research, I feel like I'm good to go. Now, in, on the more complicated cases where you have to, you know, you're dealing with different people, you're having to, a lot of times I have to listen to podcasts and watch television shows and what not to supplement the information that I'm finding. So that can lead into more time. But usually the way we do it, you know, it's strictly from news sources. We try not to delve too much into Facebook or anything like that because you get into more conjecture. Things aren't verified. So, yeah, taking everything offline takes me about a day. And then you have the other work that you'll do when you contact uh, the police if you have to. Oh, yes. And actually, that's really the easiest part. I just I'm just as honest with them as I can be. I let them know how we conduct our business and. Just let them know, you know, this isn't some fly by night thing. You know, I'm not going to get out there and throw your name around and embarrass anybody. And so far, that approach has worked. One thing that you mentioned uh, when we started talking about um, the river and and how shallow uh, that area is, you said that you were down there. Have you gone down there because of this uh, disappearance or yes. is it just something that you've done? But OK, so you you took a trip down there. Yes, I've been down there, I believe, with my father fishing before, but I specifically went down there this time to look around, to see what was going on. I took some video for John because we did a searchlight on this case. And I took, you know, video footage of the river, of, you know, standing down there, looking up, all you see is the highway. You know, no, I showed when you pull down, when you're on the highway, there's no way to see it, all that good stuff. And even, you know, even like the weeds and whatnot that were around that area, they're no, they're no higher than waist deep. And with it being flat, the woods would be the only place that you could go to hide. It just, I don't know. That's why I have always felt like her car was put under the bridge. I don't really feel like the river has anything to do with it other than it was convenient. And it helped keep her car off the radar even longer. This is uh, mysterious. It is. Yeah. It is. um... And that's what keeps me coming back to this is what in the world could have happened? You almost feel like the more you look at these cases the more you'll get a feel for humanity and maybe have a better idea. But every person is so different. There's just no telling. And without any leads, we can't even start really down an avenue that will lead us anywhere. Do you think it's more likely she ran away or was met with foul play? I think foul play. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Because there haven't even been any sightings. Nothing. Yeah, with the cigarettes and the... And the phone in the car, it, it does make it seem like, and the flat tire, you know, it makes it seem like she was in need of help or possibly went really quick to speak to someone mm-hmm. and didn't return to her car. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I mean, they were, and her keys are with her somewhere. I know they've searched the area pretty thoroughly. I would think if they had thrown her keys into the tall grass or something, it would have been found by now because even the family will still go out and search, you know, on occasion. I don't know. I think with COVID, they might not have done as much, but this year things are opening back up and I, I'm going to keep a lookout to see if they have any searches, if they have any vigils or anything, because I'd like to attend one. When you do all of this work um, for John and you appear on you know, our show, what do you hope happens? What's your call to action for listeners other than keep talking about these missing person cases? Well, always, especially with women, I'm just like, just always, you know, spatial awareness, know your surroundings, keep up with what's going on around you. Don't let something blindside you. It's very easy to do. But no, other than that, it's just always, you know, share, share, talk about this. Make sure nobody forgets her. Make sure that this reaches as many people as possible. And that's great advice. It's so easy to get caught up in your own head when you're out and about, you yes. know, and, and you do get blindsided. Um, so that is, that is great advice. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I'm real big on personal safety. You know, I don't believe you should be carrying knives and guns with you, but have your keys, have a keychain fob, know a little self-defense, just always be aware of what's going on around you. 
Oh, and another thing that's really important that I always talk about is always have something on your phone that people can see what you're doing. I like to use Life360. You know, if anything were to happen to me, it'll get me within a thousand feet of where that last cell phone ping was through Life360. What, so, what is that? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's a free app that you can get for your phone. And you can you put people into groups like I have a family group and all of my family can see where I'm going when I'm driving. They know how much cell phone I have. And if I have a car accident, it'll let them know I've had an accident that way. You know, if I even if I was to walk out into the woods and suddenly disappear, they're going to be able to follow that cell phone signal so far. So always have something like that with you. That is brilliant. It sounds like something John Lorden developed. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time. No. Nope. Somebody beat him to it. Wow. Don't shh, shh, don't say that out loud. <laughs> that That's a brilliant app. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a really good one. And I mean, I know it can be abused depending on what your family life, your situation is. I've, I've known wives, their husbands use it to track them and things like that. Right. But in a family situation, when it's your children or your husband, if nothing else, it's comforting just to be able to look at it during the day and see where they're at. You mentioned a fob. Is that like a, some kind of uh, hidden weapon, I suppose? Well, these little fobs, and I can't remember what they're called. Um, they're, they look like just little ornaments that hang on your keychain. But you can put your keys between your fingers and these things will stick out. You know, they'll puncture, they'll hurt, they're made out of metal. So you can't carry brass knuckles, but your keys and, a, and some good keychain fobs will take care of it. You could carry brass knuckles, but it wouldn't be very legal. No, it definitely wouldn't be. And I actually had some for a while. I heard someone on the news had been arrested and charged because they had brass knuckles with them. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> let me just get rid of those real quick. <laughs> let me just <laughs> slide these in a drawer. Yeah. <laughs> Flush them down the toilet. But that fob advice is pretty is pretty good. Um, and do they still make those like little police batons for uh, keychains? I don't know if they do or not. You can still buy the batons, and mm. that's something small that folds right into your purse. Yeah, or a it, flashlight, one of those like um, little mag lights. Oh that, that, yes, that's pretty effective. Yes, mag lights. It's even the big ones. If you put one down beside your seat in the car, leave one of the batteries out. If you ever have to swing that thing, it's like a club because those mag lights are solid metal. I just keep a microphone in my car. <laughs> yeah, if you broadcast it, <laughs> yeah. you'll be like, I'm broadcasting right now. The, you, you'll cancel them. Yeah, that'll be our defense. We can cancel them. If you had your microphone and you had your uh, XLR cable, you could you could probably swing that cable around <laughs> that. The, the, um, the plug part of that cable, yeah. uh, that could do some damage. <laughs> wow where, just, where are we going with this I'm, i don't know i had the mental <laughs> image of you standing there swinging that thing around <laughs> yeah awesome. it's got some weight to it <laughs> well yeah i love how this uh conversation went to uh went to yeah. safety um is there is there a phone number that we can give if anyone's got any information in brooke's disappearance absolutely if anyone has information, call the Independence County Sheriff's Office at 870-793-8838, or you can call the Arkansas State Police at 501-618-8000. They have another number, 501-618-8777, or you can also go to their website, info at asp.arkansas.gov. 